Good evening and welcome. I've been instructed by my wife to remind everybody to please turn your cell phones off. So let me do that and give you a second to do it. I'm Murray Levin, your host for the seven part free library series, Orson Welles and the Golden Age of Hollywood. For those of you who've been along for the ride so far, you'll recall that back in April, we were with David Nassau, who provided us with a fascinating look at young Orson Welles' life. That was the young actor, the young radio man, and the man who produced the unforgettable War of the Worlds with the invasion from Mars. And then in May, we had Peter DeCherney, and he introduced us on a tour of the Hollywood that Orson Welles met as a 24-year-old when he went there uh, to begin his film career. And that was an era of great films. That was the studio system. That was The Wizard of Oz and uh, films like that. Well, tonight we've come to a kind of a critical juncture in the saga of Orson Welles. We're going to look at the struggle to make Citizen Kane. Now, Welles, as a young man, 24 or 25, something like that, was lured to Hollywood by RKO Studios and its uh, irrepressible president, George Schaefer. And they did so by giving him one of the most unbelievable contracts that a director had ever gotten. This was a contract that not only had a huge payoff to Orson Welles, but in addition to that, it gave him final cut. That is to say, he had the right to finish the movie, to make the movie the way he saw it. And of course, for years, great Hollywood directors uh, whose names might come to mind, let's say Howard Hawks or people like that, they would have died for that. So one thing you might think about is, Wells may not have been the most popular man in Hollywood as a 24-year-old getting this kind of a contract. And there were more than a few people who I think would have been gratified to see him fail. Now, tonight, we're going to learn about the struggle to make Citizen Kane from a tremendously qualified, likable guy that I think you're going to really enjoy, and that's Michael Phillips. Before I just say a word about Michael, I do want to acknowledge support, very generous support that has been given to this program and is helping to make it possible from the Lydia uh, Eloise Seibert Fund through the Free Library Fund. So I do want to give a shout out to the Lydia Eloise Seibert Fund. Now, who is our speaker? Who is Michael Phillips? Well, he has a multifaceted career and personality, I might say, but let me just dwell on the career a little. For one thing, he teaches at the University of Chicago, and he teaches a course on uh, scoring films, that is, putting together the soundtracks. So that's a kind of an interesting thing, and I'll tell you, he knows everything about the music that you hear in a lot of movies, and we kind of take some of it for granted. He's a journalist. He's had a distinguished career and continues as a film critic. Uh, he's been at such papers as the St. Paul Pioneer Press, a, a paper I'm kind of partial to since my wife's from St. Paul. And he was with the LA Times, and now he writes for the Chicago Tribune, a famous national uh, newspaper. So teaching at the university, writing columns, reviewing films, and in addition to that, television host. Television host extraordinaire for many years. I uh, served as a guest host on my favorite channel, and I, I bet a lot of you like it too, Turner Classic Movies. And he's also been with ABC Disney. So before uh, bringing him up, let me just say this. You've got a role tonight also. When Michael finishes, and you're gonna be pretty much worn out because there's a lot there, but I want you to keep your thinking caps on because I wanna have some questions for him. What's on your mind? So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to bring you Michael Phillips.
Hey, folks. Uh, first of all, I want to just take care of this uh, menacing little uh, figure on there. There we go. Hang on. Hang on. This is, uh, this is just the problem with getting... Um, the, the Tribune doesn't like to pay for anything called Apple. It's... Uh, <laughs> uh, this, I think actually this computer just says at the top, Murray's. So thank you. <laughs> um, thanks for that introduction. And, uh, and folks, thank you for this rescheduled turnout. I mean, that really says something, and I, I so appreciate it. And you have the most beautiful library. You just do. So uh, that, that's been great already for me. Um, first of all, do you mind if we start with two and a half minutes of music? Um, I shouldn't pose that as a question, because we actually are going to listen to two and a half minutes of music. Uh, this is the overture also known as The Inquirer, written by the great film composer Bernard Herrmann. Uh, this is, um, Herrmann was one of the most valuable of all the Mercury Theater colleagues brought to Hollywood from New York, best known for radio, brought by Orson Welles in 1940 for the making and very nearly the unmaking of the film we're tonight going to discuss a little. The overture from Citizen Kane this is his first score, Herman's first score for the movies, written for the film and the filmmaker we're here to talk about tonight. Come to this theater when Citizen Kane plays here. You decide for yourself. just a great gust of wind. I love that. Um, now, for those who have seen Citizen Kane, who's, whoop, whoop, hang on, who's seen it? Who's actually, uh, who's actually seen it? <laughs> who has not seen it? Who has not seen it? Okay. Okay, I'm going to try to play to all ends of the crowd here. Um, 
so I'm going to tell you the ending. No, I'm not going to tell you the ending. It's, <laughs> although it's pretty famous and, you know, it's almost too late culturally to hide the ending, or the, what, what the meaning of the key word of this film is. But um, uh, anyway, the, uh, you might remember that in the early scenes of Citizen Kane, if you have seen it, um, you're following Charles Foster Kane's rise as a mighty and, and mighty flawed newspaper mogul and later enters American politics, encounters American scandal, and finally endures a classic American downfall. America, I think, has always loved a success story. Citizen Kane was, in the words of Orson Welles, who co-wrote it, directed it, starred in it, and was almost immediately maligned and revered for it. Orson Welles called it a failure story. Citizen Kane is told from multiple perspectives, giving us tantalizing, sometimes contradictory assessments of a fictional public figure who Wells wrote, quote, retreats from a democracy which his money fails to buy and, has, and his power fails to control. If only the leading Republican presidential contender for 2024 would make a similar retreat <laughs> before it's too late. And that concludes the political portion of this presentation. I only bring it up because Donald Trump has often said that his favorite movie is Citizen Kane. So it's a free country. Orson Welles, I contend, made the greatest directorial debut in world cinema, 82 years after its release. I think it's still true. Roger Ebert, my late friend from Chicago said something I love to share with folks who may not have heard it yet. With truly great films, it is not what the film is about, it's how it's about it. A great film is more than just how the storyline reads in a synopsis. Kane, largely, clearly, but not entirely based on the media giant, political operator, and Hollywood power broker William Randolph Hearst, he dies, Kane that is, in his sumptuous, eerily lonely estate, Xanadu. His last word, Rosebud. We have heard and seen that whisper in so many Oscar celebrations of, you know, Rosebud. Incredible tight close-up. Unforgettable. Um, we never learn in the film, interestingly, I think, uh, who actually overhears Kane utter that before dying. He seems to be alone in that room. Interesting little riddle there. Continuity error? Possibly. <laughs> but I love it. I love, I love the question. What does Rosebud mean? This is what a team of reporters working for the News on the March newsreel team want to tell when they tell the story of Cain. You know, they want to find out what was behind that word. So um, they, that's the premise. It is a mystery. It's set up like a mystery. What is the meaning of this word? And one reporter, whose face we never actually clearly see in the film, goes hunting for answers, interviewing all these different corners of Kane's life, all these people from his past. So it's a mystery. It's a newspaper comedy, too, sort of. It's a thundering melodrama at times. It's mocking, sarcastic, the work of complete and total Weisenheimers out to make a mark and needle its presumptive subject, Hearst. It's that too, I think. Everything I think Citizen Kane was and is, especially in its scenes of young Kane galloping through history. You can hear that in the music we just heard. Antic, kinetic, propulsive, that is that film. And that's the how it's about its subject. It is not a solemn, pretend biopic. It is the opposite. Citizen Kane, released barely in 1941, is also bitterly nostalgic, melancholic, I think maybe even tragic. But it is not, I contend, a tearjerker or a heart warmer. It is, Wells himself said, an icy experience. And it surely was the most brazen affront to a living legend, whatever came out, any living legend that ever came out of the golden age of Hollywood. Now, Wells, I think, was not really of that age. His Hollywood adjacency, let's call it, 
was such that his ridiculous rise that Murray talked about, this insane contract we'll talk about later, this unbelievably sweetheart deal, uh, you know, was, was met almost instantly by a tsunami of ill will and, uh, and, and all of Hollywood, with a few exceptions, was essentially rooting for his soggy fall from grace just, you know, just so the, this punk kid from the East Coast Theater could get his comeuppance, okay? What happened? What happened to Citizen Kane? How did Citizen Kane come so close to being destroyed forever after it was completed? If things had gone just a little bit differently, just a little bit, Kane would have been just one more lost film in the history of lost, destroyed, or mutilated films we dream now, today, of discovering somewhere miraculously whole. And if Citizen Kane had been destroyed, I do not know what I'd be up here tonight talking to you about. Probably Casablanca, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> First, uh, a one minute prologue to tell you where things really started with, um, with our subject tonight. <laughs> that this next part the magnificence of, the magnificence of Orson Welles began in 1915 he was born in Kenosha Wisconsin a prosperous factory town on Lake Michigan his father Richard Wells got rich by inventing a carbide lamp used for automobiles and bicycles Wells's mother Beatrice was a cultural beacon a concert pianist the first woman elected to city government in Kenosha on the Board of Education. Kenosha's public library dominated the town square. It does still. It's one block from the house where Orson Welles spent his first three years, right here. 6116 7th Avenue. It's a nice 20 minute walk along 7th from where I spent my first three years in Kenosha with my folks, my brother, my parents, on the second floor of my grandparents' house. And this is Orson Welles waving a flag. Very likely a parade was passing by. We don't know, we can't know all the details or the whole story of anyone's life, not even our own. Now, Orson Welles had an older brother, Dickie, who had a very difficult and unhappy life from the beginning. Painfully isolated, struggling with barely or misdiagnosed learning disabilities, his parents did not know what to do with him. His father mocked everything about him, his stutter, his lack of promise. Eventually, Dickey was diagnosed as schizophrenic. He was institutionalized for 10 years. And Orson later said he saw his brother as they were adults twice in their life together. Orson was the family's bright star, though he did not have that family for long. His formidable mother died of hepatitis when Orson was nine. The last time Orson saw his father alive, he had told him he would not see him again until he quit drinking. And then his father basically drank himself to death. Orson was 15, and for the rest of his life he carried a crippling load of guilt. Orson poured his energies into everything he was good at, drawing, painting, acting, especially acting. He flourished at the Todd School for Boys in Woodstock, Illinois, where he met the man he called Skipper, Headmaster Roger Hill. They remained good and grateful friends for the rest of Wells' life. Hill was a key father figure in the future filmmaker's life, along with Wells' guardian, Dr. Maurice Bernstein, whom Orson called Dada. He was a longtime family friend of Orson's parents and very likely the longtime lover of Orson's mother. Much of this family history was covered in David Nassau's talk here on this stage back in April. I caught it on YouTube the other night, and I'm glad I did. On his own, after both his parents had left this earth, teenaged Orson sailed to Ireland, did some painting, eventually talked his way into working at the Gate Theater in Dublin. This was 1931. The boy from Kenosha, who soon enough moved to Chicago, told the Dublin theatrical community he was the star of the prestigious New York Theater Guild and was available for hire. It was a whopping lie, <laughs> a bluff, let's call it, in a lifetime filled with magic sets, homemade theatricals, and the need and the expectation to entertain and dazzle the adults always 
Orson Welles had been fooling and beguiling people his entire young life. Tumbling through history, back in America, at a party in Chicago, Welles meets Thornton Wilder, author of Our Town, among others, who later in New York introduces Welles to the critic and columnist Alexander Wolcott of the Algonquin Roundtable crowd. Wolcott arranges a meeting with the actress Catherine Cornell. Wells gets hired for her company and plays Tybalt in Romeo and Juliet on Broadway, directed by Cornell's husband, Guthrie McClintock. With that voice of his, that beautiful, sonorous baritone, Wells was made for radio. Not yet 20 years old, he soon became one of the medium's busiest and highest paid actors. He was the voice of the shadow, among others, and he became very big, very busy. So busy, in fact, that in order to get from one radio studio to another in Manhattan for live broadcasts, for back-to-back -back live broadcasts, Wells would tumble into a rented ambulance, the driver would plow through midtown traffic, sirens blaring, just to get him to the gig on time. And he was learning all the time, all these shows, He's already done a lot of theater, a tremendous amount of radio, getting increasingly famous, if yet sort of partially invisible to the public because he was not known for his face yet. Um, uh, but he was learning all the time what could be done with sound to entice the listener and make them believe in the make-believe. So into all this tumult in the mid-30s came for Wells many things. His first marriage, the first of three, one of those marriages was to Rita Hayworth. And here we start putting the Kane story, the Citizen Kane story together. Another development, perhaps the key one in Wells' theatrical career, came around this same time. Wells meets John Hausman. Do you remember John Hausman as an actor? Paper Chase won the Oscar. He's a respected young producer at the time, working for the Federal Theater Project, which was part of Roosevelt's Works Progress Administration Relief Program, what we now referred to as the WPA. And now I'm going to do a Orson Welles radio copy thing. Okay. <laughs> just, just throw it on the floor when you're done. I like that. So Hausman invites Welles to join him at the so-called Negro Theater Unit of the WPA, where Welles staged a sensational production of Macbeth set in Haiti. It was called the Voodoo Macbeth, and it caused a sensation. Nobody had ever seen anything like it in New York or anywhere. Then, in 1937, Wells and Hausman started the Mercury Theater. Okay, let's get a couple images here. These are images from Wells' production of Julius Caesar. Very little scenery. The modern dress production was inspired by photographs and newsreel footage of Hitler's Nuremberg rally. Wells denied any anti-fascist intent Already, lots of Republican congressmen were trying to kill the federal theater for its so-called den of radicalism, but he couldn't disguise, really, the content of this production. Julius Caesar, in every moment of Wells' staging, was a warning cry against fascism. This was living, terrifying Shakespeare, the opposite of the productions we see as young people that turn, a, turn a, us off Shakespeare until we finally stumble on a production that lights the fire for us. Hang on just one sec. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I want you to take a look at one thing in the second image from Julius Caesar. Um, it had a look, not just because it referenced what was going on in the world with Hitler and Mussolini at the time, but it had a look nobody had seen before. Look at the layers of action in this image with George Kalouris as Mark Antony upstage, lit from below. And then you have a mob, the, and then downstage you have light falling from on high for the mob in fedoras. This is the kind of depth of field, three layers of action, incredible silhouette behind the whole scene that you see when Wells and his cinematographer, Greg Toland, brought similar ideas to Citizen Kane three years later. Lots of Hollywood filmmakers came from the theater, but only Wells came from the kind of theater that Orson Wells made. And this is Wells as seen in another Mercury Theater triumph as Captain Shotover in George Bernard Shaw's Heartbreak House. It made the cover of Time Magazine. 
He's in there somewhere underneath all that. <laughs> Halloween night, later that same year, 1938, Wells and his less heralded Mercury Theater of the Air cohorts mounted a fiendishly effective version of H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds, written and produced for CBS Radio. Now, estimates vary, but some say approximately six million people heard that broadcast. You know, solid numbers, not amazing, but solid. And the estimates have it that roughly a million of those six million were completely hoodwinked by it. They thought they were suffering a Martian invasion and it was time to leave. Um, and it was the kind of showmanship and the kind of unbelievable hoopla and controversy and news reports and panic, you know, a million, I mean, think of it, a million people all over the country um, flipping out, let's say. <laughs> and, and this was the kind of showmanship. Well, what was it, a prank, a magic act in sound? A stroke of documentary style genius, it was all that, but whatever it was, Hollywood could not ignore that kind of noise. They couldn't. Now, in 1939, as Murray's already mentioned, RKO Pictures made well the deal of deals and arrived in a nick of time for the Mercury Theater. They had had a couple of flops by then, and money was very tight. Wells spent a lot of money of the money he made, and then RKO head George Schaefer offered Wells this unprecedented two picture deal to produce, direct, and write, and star in two feature films with no strings, essentially. I mean, he, they needed budget approval over 500,000, but under 500,000, you make any movie you want. They just have to sign off on the basic idea, and you can go to town. And so the RKO had story approval and that budget approval if the budget went over half a million. But Wells had final cut, and no director in Hollywood, as we heard, had final cut, but Orson Welles did. All told, it was probably the best deal a filmmaker had ever gotten in Hollywood since F.W. Murnau came to Hollywood from Germany 13 years earlier at the end of the silent era to make Sunrise, which is subtitled Sunrise, the song of, A Song of Two Humans, which is a stunning film and kind of a comparable achievement because it's, it's got visual splendor and trickery going on every second, which, which Wells' film did too. Um, that's a film, I think, that has the same kind. These two films share the same kind of visual texture and camera fluidity. Even today, some films like Sunrise and Citizen Kane look like they were made tomorrow, not yesterday. And that's definitely one of them here, Citizen Kane. Wells took a very long time to figure out what to do with that sweetheart deal, though. He wanted to do, first, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, and he, in fact, wrote a full screenplay built around the idea of the camera being the character of Marlowe, thereby putting the audience in this first-person visual position always. He did a lot of pre-production on Heart of Darkness, and Wells was to play both Marlowe, the point-of-view emissary, and Kurtz, the lord of the Congo. But it was too expensive, so RKO passed on that one. Wells then suggested a modern political thriller with an anti-fascist theme, Smiler with a Knife. Again, no. And then, Wells met his filmmaking destiny, Herman J. Mankiewicz, wise-cracking former newspaper man who'd gone Hollywood and become one of the most versatile, whoop, sorry. He'd gone Hollywood and become one of the most versatile there we go. And entertaining writers around, also the most unreliable and also one of the drunkest. He was a chronic alcoholic, and uh, here he is with Wells. Six, month into the, six months into Wells' lavish RKO contract, Wells had not found his movie yet, and the wolves were howling for his failure, as Murray said. Uh, much of the Hollywood press and most of the film industry were drooling over the prospect of this boy genius's downfall, and he hadn't even really gotten up yet. He and Mankiewicz wanted a really big, juicy subject to tackle. Dillinger, maybe? They thought maybe, well, what about a John Dillinger character? Maybe, if not Dillinger, a Dillinger type. Or what about Howard Hughes or a Howard Hughes type, who was then a movie maker uh, almost entirely, and of course an aviator. Maybe a more conventional topic, they thought. Maybe they, uh, well, they considered, among other things, the life story, of, uh, more of a conventional biopic of Alexandre Dumas, the writer, the author of Count of Monte Cristo, Three Musketeers, and they thought about 
you know, RKO suggestion of, well, what about the hit Broadway comedy, The Man Who Came to Dinner by George Kaufman and Moss Hart. Um, maybe we'll have uh, Wells play the lead in that. And they passed on that. And then Mank, as he's known, Mankiewicz, suggested this man, William Randolph Hearst, whom everybody knew, a lot of people feared, and he was a man who made his name on so-called yellow journalism, occasionally factual, plenty combative, combative heavily self-interested journalism. Hearst was also a not-so-secret force in Hollywood with his own production unit at MGM. And largely, he was interested in the career of his longtime mistress, Marion Davies, a great silent star floundering a little in the sound era. Now, she and Mankiewicz were comrades in alcohol. And more than once, sorry, more than once, Mank joined the Hollywood elite for weekends at Hearst's comically expansive estate about four hours' drive from Hollywood, San Simeon. Who has been to San Simeon? Yeah. It's worth the trip, right? Yeah. It sits on a plot of land that is half the size of Rhode Island. And it has 61 bathrooms. The older I get, the more I admire anybody <laughs> who had this, the urinary foresight to equip this palace with 61 bathrooms. Now, maybe there was something there, well said. And maybe there's something in this disguised, fictionalized portrait we could do of Hearst, a titanic public figure who turns progressively less progressive and more reactionary and isolated across a lifetime of privilege and ambition. Maybe Hearst, along with various other real-life figures Wells knew of his Chicago years, maybe Hearst and these other titans of industry, all not, not unfamiliar with scandal, um, could be enough, could be big enough for Wells' first feature. So, here we go. Wells', Wells turned it over to Mankiewicz. Mankiewicz's first draft was a huge, ungainly thing titled simply American. The basics were there and then some. This was going to be a kaleidoscope, an ever-shifting character study told from the viewpoints and his memories recalled by key figures in Charles Foster Kane's life after his funeral. One perspective comes from his ex-wife, Susan Alexander, the failed opera star who never wanted to be an opera star. That was Kane's idea. Another from his business manager, Mr. Bernstein. Another from Kane's best friend, Mr. Leland, the drama critic and the story's conscience. Another from the shadowy butler tipping around the corners of Xanadu, the, Florida's, the movie's Florida set answer to San Simeon. So Mankiewicz writes this wildly flamboyant, globetrotting first draft and it made for an auspicious and essentially unfilmable movie. <laughs> it was only four hours or so. The revisions began, and this was not un uncommon. You turn in a monster draft and you cut it down, cut it down, right? Um, the revisions began and they were overseen, edited, and soon enough contributed to by Wells and John Hausman. Thanks to the Robert, uh, sorry, thanks to the late Robert Carringer high, in my view, among Wells scholars, actual Wells scholars, unlike myself, we have a really good idea right now, thanks to his work, about who actually wrote what in Citizen Kane. This is a huge debate because there was a lot of credit battling and uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of interest in, in not everybody, Wells took, uh, you know, freely took too much claim, in fact, all the claim in some interviews for writing it. Um, Mankiewicz then countered at the time uh, uh, with saying, no, actually, uh, I wrote the whole damn thing. And so it was, it was kind of a, you know, a he said, he said for a long time. But, but the, the research and the scholarship of this really good Wells scholar, Robert Carringer, has kind of gotten us closer to the truth. The credits we see on the screen from the available script evidence and all the different drafts that exist is basically the truth. Screenplay by Herman J. Mankiewicz and Orson Welles in that order. And actually, after all that, you know, all that sort of struggle, it was true. <laughs> it's basically true what you see on the screen. So, RKO's legal department freaks out when they find out just how closely, in some particulars, Kane resembles the powerful and very potentially litigious William Randolph Hearst. Early drafts of the script, eventually retitled Citizen Kane, 
are bursting with ideas and incidents. Political assassination in an early draft. Kane's son, who's barely in the final shooting script, was conceived initially by Mankiewicz as a boy who turns into a young white nationalist, proto-fascist troublemaker. He's killed in an attack on the Washington, D.C. armory. Talk about shades of Trump and a harbinger of the future. History always seems to be tumbling ahead of us, looking backward for ideas. In the movie, Susan Alexander, interviewed by the newsreel reporter about her memories of Kane, mentions that he should talk to the butler down at Xanadu. He knows where the bodies are buried, she says. Now, in Mankiewicz's earlier versions, the butler really did know where the body was buried because Kane had his wife's lover, the Xanadu stable boy, killed, thus turning the fictionalized version of Hearst into a murderer with clean hands but a dirtier soul, okay? So partly for legal reasons, partly to get this thing down to two hours, the revisions continued with Wells editing like a master. He was very good under pressure. Everything he ever did, he loved having his back up against the wall and, and rewrites just with no questions. I mean, he was a genius under pressure. And it was self-made pressure. He, he, he was, it was the kind of thing where, you know, we've all worked with people who basically uh, complain about having to clean up messes, but of course they basically cause the mess, so that swells, I think. You know. um, uh, he's, he's rewriting brilliantly uh, and, and making all these exchanges, long, discursive, kind of chunky monologues that Mankiewicz loved to write uh, into much tighter, more effective, more speakable and actable encounters. And many interesting, completely original contributions from Wells that just whizzed through and covered decades at a time in just a few brilliant strokes. For those who know the film really well, you may remember there's a famous scene at the breakfast table featuring Wells and Ruth Warwick as the first Mrs. Kane, Emily Norton, the president's niece and their marriage is conveyed by Wells' revisions in just a few very tart exchanges. Each conversation over coffee at the breakfast table, uh, amorous at first, it's a great scene, the first one, chilly as a, a Chicago December day as it goes on, takes place at a table that gets a little longer and a little longer and a little longer, just as the marriage is getting a little worse and worse and more distant, and it's just, just the, it's the, you teach that's something to teach people always you can you can show that scene to any screenwriting class any directing class any acting class and it's just it's it's the best still um, Wells brought out his Mercury theater players from New York once the script was about ready filming began in 1940 conducted without any interference or even set visits from the RKO brass. This is great. If studio, if studio executives had the nerve to maybe check in on them, at least find out were they making a movie in there, Wells would actually call for a break and the entire production crew would just start playing baseball on the soundstage. I mean, for 20 minutes. And then the RKO executives would just slink away. You know, and then they would, okay, let's start, let's, we'll, now, we'll, now we'll start making the movie again. So. Uh, he, he really pushed his luck and he got away with it always, always, almost always. Hollywood's premier cinematographer, Greg Toland, wanted to work with Wells because Wells had never made a movie and he had a thousand ideas for crazy things to try with the camera, with lighting. They built and filmed opaque ceilings that looked real but had all the lights behind them and nobody had ever seen that many ceilings, in an, certainly in a Hollywood film, ever and it gave the movie an instantly different look and it didn't quite occur to the average moviegoer eye. Why, why does this look so different? Always, every shot. That was one reason among a hundred. Fully half of Citizen Kane's individual shots contain some sort of optical effect or miniature or bit of animation, all tricks of the eye and for the eye and all the better to tell its story in a way that nobody else had ever done it before or, or would even think about doing. The film's development of deep focus photography where everything, foreground and background, remains in sharp focus. This wasn't actually new, but Toland and Wells brought it to a new realm of expressive impact. Stage trained and emboldened by what worked for him in the theater, Wells turned out to be a master of staging and blocking actors for the camera, whether moving or stationary. And his images in Kane gave the audience more to see in a given shot, any given shot, than they had ever been shown before. 
I don't know how to run a newspaper, Mr. Thatcher, Kane says in the movie, to his disapproving guardian. I just try everything I can think of. And that pretty much sums it up for how Wells approached movie making and Citizen Kane. Thank God. Wells even had the final say over one of the most singular and certainly eccentric movie trailer, coming attraction trailers I've ever seen. And this was the coming attractions trailer for Citizen Kane, you know, made by Wells uh, for Citizen Kane. And uh, this, this may be new to most of you, so let's, uh, let's take a look at it. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Orson Welles. I'm speaking for the Mercury Theater, and what follows is supposed to advertise our first motion picture. Citizen Kane is the title, and we hope it can correctly be called a coming attraction. It's certainly coming, coming to this theater, and I think our Mercury actors make it an attraction. I'd like you to meet them. Speaking of attractions, well, the chorus girls are certainly an attraction. But frankly, ladies and gentlemen, we're just showing you the chorus girls for purposes of ballyhoo. It's a pretty nice ballyhoo. But here are some of our real Mercury people. This is the first time you've seen most of them on the screen. Hey, uh, give Joe a little light. Thanks. Now smile for the folks, Joe. Smile. Joseph Cotton, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. Joseph Cotton. I think you're going to see a lot of him. Here's Ruth Warwick, whom I know you love. Ruth. Look at the camera, Ruth. We caught Ruth with her hair up. And here's somebody you've all heard on the radio, so I don't have to tell you he's wonderful. Ray Collins. Dorothy Comengore is a name I'm going to repeat. Dorothy Comengore. I won't have to repeat it much longer. You'll be repeating it. And here's George Kouluris, who's a grand actor. I'll say that name again. George Kouluris. Watch it. Here comes Everett Sloan. Look out, Everett. Oops. Everett Sloan, ladies and gentlemen. He isn't necessarily a comedian. And here's one of the best actors in the world. Agnes Moorhead. I've said a lot of nice things, but Erskine Sanford deserves some more. Erskine, Erskine Sanford. So does Paul. Paul, Paul Stewart, everybody. Citizen Kane is a modern American story about a man called Kane, Charles Foster Kane. I don't know how to tell you about him. There's so many things to say. I'll turn you over instead to the characters in the picture. As you'll see, they feel very strongly on the subject. Charles Foster Kane is... Sure, he started the war. But do you think if it hadn't been for Mr. Kane, the United States would have the Panama Canal? Charles Foster Kane is nothing more or less than a communist! Kane, governor. Listen, when the voters of this state and Mrs. Kane learn what I found out about Mr. Kane and a certain little blondie named Susan Alexander, he couldn't be elected dog catcher. I'm going to skin Mr. Charles Foster Kane alive. I'm going to marry him next week at the White House. Emily, I hear you've been stepping out with Charlie Kane. I... Of course I love him. I gave him $60 million. Well, of course I love him. He's the richest man in America. But all the girls say about him at first. But you know, I can't help but admire him. He's crazy. He's wonderful. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you'll think about Mr. Kane. I can't imagine. You see, I play the part myself. Well, Kane is a hero. And a scoundrel, a no account, and a swell guy, a great lover, a great American citizen, and a dirty dog. It depends on who's talking about him. What's the real truth about Charles Foster Kane? I wish you'd come to this theater when Citizen Kane plays here and decide for yourself. <laughs> That wild. Um, a lot of things going on in there. A, they're already. I think Wells by that point had started to listen to RKO's uh, entreaties about, like, you know, let's 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 really not uh, indicate how much we're dealing with uh, Ran William Randolph Hearst, because there's no there's no sense of what you're really going to get in the movie from this <laughs> trailer, um, except that you're playing very much on Wells's radio fame. You know, the voice, which he had, God, right from the beginning. Now comes the hard part of this story for Wells. Odds are that wherever that trailer played in theaters, 
Those same theaters refused to play the movie when it finally did get released in 1941. The completed Kane sat on the runway a long time. In early 41, frustrated by the release delay and nervous probably about the film's inevitable controversy, Wells and RKO head George Schaefer started screening it privately for all kinds of influential people. Hollywood gossip columnist Hedda Hopper, sworn enemy of the Hearst columnist Luella, Luella Parsons, got an early look at it. She was, she said, quote, appalled. This film was too well done. It's an impudent, murderous trick, even for the boy genius, to perpetuate on the newspaper giant Hearst. Parsons, the Hearst columnist, was enraged she didn't get to see it and rat it out first. And here's where the political maneuvering really got going. Parsons contacts John D. Rockefeller, a key RKO stockholder, suggesting, demanding really, that the planned New York premiere of Citizen Kane at Radio City Music Hall be canceled, and it was. Hearst forbids any mention of Kane in any of his newspapers, and eventually he refuses to accept any advertising, not just for Kane, but for any RKO picture. And that hit RKO right where they lived. MGM, MGM's head, Louis B. Mayer, offered RKO nearly a million dollars, roughly the entire Kane production budget, to buy the negative of Kane and all the prints and burn them. And Schaefer refused, at first without even mentioning the offer to RKO's board of directors because he was afraid of what they would vote. But Kane editor Robert Wise, who later directed West Side Story, Sound of Music, <clears throat> he recalls attending a crucial board meeting in New York that ultimately determined the fate of this movie. At that meeting, Wells pulls out all the stops. He talks about censorship, freedom of expression, the Bill of Rights, and it worked. RKO did not blink. Editor Wise says that it may have been the greatest performance Orson Welles ever gave, and the public never saw it. <laughs> Hearst was not done yet, though. He threatened to smear all the studios with anti-Semitic charges of letting the Jews run things, quote, and suspicious sympathies toward all these European refugees that have been coming over, fleeing Hitler, taking jobs away from, quote, real Americans. Columns saying just those sorts of things ran routinely in Hollywood trade papers at the time. RKO had booked Kane for, among others, a traditional release in Fox's West Coast theater chain, about 500 theaters, but they gave in to Hearst pressure. They booked it, and they never showed it. To recycle the old joke, Kane wasn't really released it just escaped here and there. But it couldn't really get far with the public that way, obviously. And honestly, probably, Kane never was destined, I think, for huge popular success. Wells himself acknowledges the curious iciness at the film's core. That's his phrase. It's a film, he said, written by one man who despised him, the central character, that is, Herman J. Mankiewicz. That's the one man. And it was written also by another man, Wells, who sort of loved him, <laughs> or at least sympathized with Kane and maybe understood a lot of him. Hearst never got over the movie's shrill, unhappy portrait of Marion Davies, AKA Susan Alexander Kane, seen in Kane as a no talent drunk, which Marion Davies was not. Drunk maybe, no talent, no. Hearst couldn't talk about that part out loud. He was, after all, still married. But Hearst told columnist John Chapman that anyone who liked Citizen Kane was, quote, a treasonable communist. <laughs> at the Academy Awards that year, there were boos at the mention of the film's title. This was unprecedented at the Academy Awards. This was not Hollywood's film at all. This was the work of a foreign agent. The, the movie exactly won exactly one Oscar for best screenplay and so, now, today, we all live in a world where David Fincher's movie about Herman Mankiewicz on Netflix, Mank, who has seen it, saying, everybody's seen it, few people. So we live in a world where Mank won more Oscars than Citizen Kane. It's not a bad film. It just perpetuates the probable, very probable falsehood that Mankiewicz wrote virtually every word. In Chicago, we have a very just a, a truly invaluable Wells scholar, the film critic and historian Jonathan Rosenbaum. Does Citizen Kane in any authentic way come from the golden age of Hollywood? This is a good question. Or was it, as Rosenbaum argues, quote, 
an independent feature that used Hollywood resources? Might it be, rather than a true Hollywood picture, is it more of a, what Rosenbaum calls it, the first feature of an independent avant-garde filmmaker and the only film in which he was accorded both the full range of a Hollywood studio and final cut. I think Kane is what Rosenbaum says it is, quote, an exceptional instance in filmmaking and in a filmmaking career fundamentally at odds with the Hollywood mainstream. And yet, every time the Oscars roll out another greatest hits reel of classics, moments to remember, there's, there he is again, you know, Orson Welles as Kane, a dying man, dropping that snow globe down the stairs. The nurse draws the sheet over his dead body, and there it is, that sled, Rosebud. In the end, what is Citizen Kane? Is it just another story about a man who had it all and then lost everything, who didn't get the love he needed? I'm hardly the, fir the first to point this out, but there is inarguably, I think, a tremendous and finally very moving amount of Wells's own life and personality, and yes, sadness in Charles Foster Kane. I think what Wells left us finally in conclusion here was a tri-modal masterwork. It, drawed, it, it, it drew imagistically from the theater. It drew sonically in its stunning array of overlapping dialogue and sound design from radio. And it survived Hearst's attempts to kill it, so it became the cinema we can study ad infinitum. Martin Scorsese once said Orson Welles was responsible, quote, for inspiring more people to be film directors than anyone else in the history of cinema. And that brings up a great distinction, I think, between two words, influential and inspirational. Jonathan Rosenbaum talks about this. Wells's brilliant debut was not really influential in some ways. It didn't lead to many or any other films like it. Although its uses of the visual vocabulary of German expressionism in turn led to the language of American film noir. This movie looks a lot like film noir of the 40s. This just happened to be made in 1940 and the visual ideas of it, other cinematographers thought, why didn't I think of that? I love those shadows. I love watching three, I love, I love it all. <laughs> and so from a technical point of view, we get an artistic point of view. Citizen Kane is a singular landmark in American modernism, and yet to a pretty wide variety of people, it is simply just a cherished classic. Art, in the end, I think is struggle, it's warfare really, when you think of what kind of risks you run of being snuffed out. The work can be snuffed out so quickly and decisively by your enemies. Kane won out though. History must have had its eye out for it. MGM did not succeed in buying it and burning it. Kane is here, always ready for exploration, debate, all of it. It's an affront, I think it's a miracle, and it's a thing of bizarrely playful beauty. Now before we open the talk, to your thoughts and questions, let's conclude with some images from the film itself. And behind these images, you'll hear Bernard Herrmann's music written, not for Citizen Kane, but for Wells' second Hollywood film, The Magnificent Ambersons, which did not survive intact. The music, I think, captures what was lost, the sound of what was lost, what was almost lost, and I think it also captures the, the memories of a boy from Kenosha who just wanted to dazzle us.
Please join me in thanking Michael Phelps for a superb presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Very, thank you. Appreciate it. So who has the first question? And please wait till one of our lovely volunteers brings you the microphone. Thank you. Could you say a little more about the actual distribution of the film in 41? How many theaters did it play in? Where did it open in New York, for instance? Did it open in LA? How many people around the country actually had a chance to it, see it? It played in all the markets you're saying. I don't have the exact number on the theaters, but it, it played at roughly, I think, a quarter of the usual release for, for theaters. I, 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 don't quote me on that. Um, but the word was out, you know. Once you start tarring people with the, the, the communism charges, and I mean, the FBI had opened a file on the guy at that point, and he was a left-leaning, you know, progressive. I don't think he was, I don't think he ever was a member of the Communist Party, but uh, um, a patchy release at best. Uh, did well here and there, you know. It did well in some cities you wouldn't expect. I think Omaha was, it was big, big in Omaha. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it, I don't think it was ever the kind of film that uh, it's not, uh, you know, the war hadn't broken out yet. I mean, it, it was just about six months before, it was May 41, it was a few months before Pearl Harbor. Um, but already it, it seemed a little exotic. It was forbidding. It's a forbidding experience to watch even now. It's not, you know, it's not uh, Betty Grable. I mean, I, I, uh, unfortunately, it's not very agreeable, but yeah. <laughs> Back there. Thank you. Fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, what is the significance of the word citizen in the title? Because that would imply some sort of everyman, where uh, Cain was certainly not that. Yeah, I mean, the phrase, I, there were phrases, I'm trying to think of some novels that would have that word in it, you know, like the phrase John Citizen, you know, was kind of like John Doe, you know, and so that was, it was just sort of um, another way of saying an American, you know. Uh, the original title, American, uh, was a little bit of a dig at a, uh, at a 1935 biogra biography of Hearst that, was, that carried that as the subtitle. So I mean, talk about pointing it up. I mean, I, you know, Mankiewicz and Wells both just really wanted to make their, you know, just make it hurt, you know, <laughs> and keep them guessing all the time and uh, about how much, you know, what's what's true. What you know, Mankiewicz was up there a lot, and uh, there is that much truth in the David Fincher film Mank, in that Mankiewicz's time at at Hearst Castle certainly, ab directly, led to a lot of the ideas. I know there is a later biography called Citizen Hearst, and I don't know if it's a play on Citizen Kane. I haven't read it, or whether he was ever known as Citizen Hearst right, in his no. own lifetime. But let's go back to the audience and the questions. One more. Yes. Oh. Wait, wait for oh, the mic. Oh, sorry. Oh. I probably don't need the mic. But, um, when you look up Orson Welles, it'll always say, thought by many to be the greatest American director, or one of the greatest American director, film directors. Can you really consider him to be a great film director when he made so few great films? Well, that's a good question. The only, uh, when we talk about his Hollywood career, you're talking about a half dozen movies. And, and they were under budgetary duress, and I mean, you know, Amberson's was taken away from him. That's a whole different, that's a whole nother presentation. But that one, that one is a heartbreaker to see what was from 131 very tough-minded adaptation of the Booth Tarkington novel, which is totally out of favor now. But um, that novel is a very harsh end, or the yeah, hard, novel and the Wells' film, a very harsh ending. And then he was off in Brazil shooting a documentary when they test screened it in, in Pomona with a Betty Grable musical, The Fleet's In. No, Dorothy L'Amour. And so it was the second film of a long night that was a, it was a Dorothy L'Amour, Eddie Bracken a musical comedy. And then along comes The Magnificent Ambersons, which is not, not, a, not a fun picture. It, but it, it, ju it just happens to be what many people think is actually 
better than Citizen Kane. I mean, even in the mutilated 88-minute version, they cut this shit out of it, and and wrote and filmed uh, all these new scenes. And you can tell the you know new director, new everything. Happy ending makes about as much sense as I don't know what, but um, ridiculous. But there's the best 40 minutes of that movie is is the only thing that can rival and probably exceed Kane. I think. So is he one of the greatest? I don't know if. if he should have been treated better by the studio system. But, you know, he didn't make him money. So, you know, it's, it's, a, cap, it's a story of capitalism. You know? This gentleman right there. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for a, a very great lecture. Um, I, I know this... I didn't attend the first two of the... Uh, last April, May, I, didn't, I missed those. So I'm going to ask you a question that uh, that has to do with some of the material bef uh, before Citizen Kane. And you mentioned um, Vo Voodoo Macbeth. And I think you did that with John Hausman. Yep. Okay, I guess my question, um, I, I was reading a little bit about, um, about Citizen Kane. I've seen it a while ago. But one thing I never understood was why did they feel that they had to do Voodoo Macbeth? It was like a, you know, a Haitian version of it. And I, I think it was well received, but why, what, what, what prompted that? What, what made it into like a voodoo performance? Why did they decide that? Well, I think that was, I, I mean, I think racially, racially probably indefensible. Uh, the results, argue, I didn't see it. I don't, know, I don't know the scholarship as well as I should on that. But Hausman was running the, what was called the Negro Theater Unit at the, w, at the, w, at the uh, Federal Theater Project. And so they needed, they were working with uh, dozens of black actors uh, who needed work. And, you know, this was, this was the way to satisfy that mandate. And, and okay, what, well, what should we do? Well, we have a play about witches, you know, the weird, you know, the, you know, the witchcraft, whatever. Let, let, let's just, we'll tilt it in that direction. Now, it was an authentic cultural viewpoint. No, it was a bunch of, you know, a bunch of white guys putting this thing together. Um, so uh, what do we say about that from a distance in hindsight, just that it was maybe a profoundly mixed blessing, <laughs> possibly? Um, I, wish I, I wish I could have seen it. Um, there's a one great story I say, do, how are we doing on time? Are, we, are, we, are, the, light, are the lights flickering yet? Uh, there was, uh, one, very, uh, one critic, Percy Hammond, who used to work for the Tribune, who's a real pill, um, uh, hated it, hated it, and hated Wells. You know, he thought he was a left-wing rat there. And this, uh, this stupid, you know, you know, I, I don't like, I don't like, you know, what, I, how dare you do that to Shakespeare, you know, how do you dare, how dare you turn it over to black performers, et cetera. Uh, and then one night, the uh, some of the uh, West African performers um, who had recently come to America were the drummers in the production, and they came up to Hausman and John Hausman and said, uh, uh, Percy Hammond, bad man. And he was like, yeah, yeah, we don't like him. He didn't like the production. Yeah, I said, huh. And then that night, voodoo ritual, some sort of voodoo ritual goes on. Percy Hammond is dead in a week of pneumonia. But I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, he didn't, he didn't have pins in him. But you know, but it was just, I mean, it's, you know, that was that was Hausman's retelling is hilarious in his autobiography. <laughs> okay, we have room for a little more over here, and then back there. Yeah, let's get, yeah, let's get these two too. Hi, um, thanks for coming. I'm a big fan of your work, and I really enjoyed oh, your the presentation. Oh, you're the one. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my question is, you know, obviously you talked about how it was not a big hit, it didn't win lots of awards, yet it's always either at the top or near the top of the list Anytime critics and scholars talk about, you know, the best films of all time. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the history of the film after the initial release and how it, it didn't just disappear, it became, you know, this iconic film? Uh, well, a lot of people genuinely thought it was the it was a, it was a high watermark, maybe the high watermark for American cinema to date. So it didn't it didn't get ignored in that regard. It, it won Best Picture from the New York uh, Film Critics Circle. Uh, a lot of people just couldn't quite reckon with what they were even watching. It was so it kind of it just looked so new. And the, this chilly tone was so intriguing, and it didn't. Your sympathies are kind of like, well, what is he a hero? Is he a bum? You know, uh, but it was an interesting set of riddles for people to figure out. Um, uh, I don't know if it was ever going to make money like uh, Going My Way would make. You know, <laughs> uh, 
um, but uh, you can also look to television, to, you know, just like just in a much softer movie, uh, the way It's a Wonderful Life, which was not a success in 1946, ends up on TV endlessly around the holidays, and suddenly it's a classic. You know? And Citizen Kane, in a much slower, more marginalized way, same thing happens. But also the French, the French, always the French, the French, the Cahiers du Cinema critics, who later became wonderful filmmakers, a lot of them you know, thought this is just amazing. And you know, a film like Citizen Kane can play a year and a half in a French cinematheque in, in Paris and develop an audience. And yeah, so t it, sometimes it just takes decades to go by. Yeah, let's see, yeah, we can, yeah, back there and then, yeah, go, go please, go ahead. Yep, nope, right. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, uh, I'm going to do the unfair thing and ask two in one, and you can give okay. whatever response. Um, so, uh, should you compare um, Orson Welles to a contemporary director? Who would you compare him to? Ooh. And um, second question is, uh, how well do you think Citizen Kane would have fared in the era of streaming? <laughs> Thank you. Yikes. Well, I can hear the meeting at Netflix. It's like, you got enough material here for a 10-parter. Let's go. We'll just, you know, just get, we can stretch this out till you're dead. Um, uh, that, the, your first question is a killer. I mean, congrats. I am dumbfounded. Uh, because it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a historically singular event to have somebody... Somebody also said it was the uh, nobody that famous had. Um, it was. It was. What would you say? It was. It was the most famous uh, uh, cultural figure. He was pretty famous before he made movies. To make his first film and have it that to have that kind of controversy, it's unique. And to have that kind of money, it's unique. So I, I'm not really sure what you think. It's really more about like uh, inventing a visual language that felt very new and and so if you look to filmmakers like i don't know i don't know who you'd look to uh give me what help me what terrence ah not too derivative spielberg uh, spielberg no too popular i mean wells never had no populist touch at all wes anderson interesting george lucas no like spielberg uh, uh, too much of a populist i mean i'm not saying bad or good i'm just saying wells had none of that in him <laughs> Todd Field. Uh, oh no, Todd Field. I'm thinking of uh, a different Todd. Um, uh, Todd Field. Yeah, like so. You're looking at Tar most recently. Um, interesting, chill, amb ambiguities, visually solid, but not. It's something. I don't know. Go see them. See the movie again, and just and just. I mean, every minute you just think, what? How? What? You know. Anyway. Uh, there's another question here in the middle. Yeah. I'm told we can have two more questions, but I want to ask you to do something before I take the questions. If you enjoyed this as much as I did, I want you to tell your friends and get your calendar out and mark July 19th because we're going to continue this saga. So. Don't forget to do this. July 19th, we're going to have Ray Kelly here, and we're going to talk about the magnificent Ambersons, among other things. Okay, let's get back to the question. Okay, sorry, sorry. okay, this is just really a little trivia question about Citizen Kane. Um, obviously, he couldn't use Hearst Castle for the exterior shots, and I heard that he used Katazan, John Ringley's house in Sarasota, for some of the exterior pictures of uh, Xanadu, do you know if that's true? I don't, I don't, I, I, I've only heard, I know for a fact, because I lived in San Diego for a few years, I used a lot of Balboa Park, uh, 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 Spanish and Italian architecture, you see it in shots here and there. Um, I don't know about that, ah. good, good question. Okay. Interesting, God, this is a very smart group. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, back there. This is the tallest question of the night here. Well, it might be a different type of question. Is the compilation that you presented with the music available anywhere? No, no. That's my own unauthorized, hope I don't get sued. Uh. Well, I thought, I thought it was beautiful and poignant. Oh, thank you. And poignant. I love that music so much. You see why I'm so crazy about the music? I just, that, that's, that's music written for Magnificent Ambersons. 
that was never used because the, you know, they screwed up the, you know, RKO took out the ending. And Bernard Herrmann, do you know him from other, like Hitchcock's, Psycho, Vertigo, all of it, uh, uh, and those two films for Wells, uh, if you listen to the full recording of the original score, only half of which was used in the movie, I think it's his, the best thing he's ever done. And that final theme, which is taken from the uh, French composer uh, Emile uh, Valtoufel, who did the Skaters Waltz. I'm going to murder that pronunciation, but uh, uh, it was it was in the public domain in the U.S. He just he liked that basic theme, but he spun all these gorgeous variations. And it's just the subtlest. Herman's kind of a sledgehammer guy sometimes, and and there's none of that in this. I mean, it it just breaks my heart. I mean, I, I um, you know, and I'm just uh, the only reason I wanted to show everybody this whole thing is that you know I'm trying to get some. Um, some cast off uh, glamour and, and reputation just because I grew up 10 blocks from the guy, you know? For... <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I got better. <laughs>